the Subcommittee on Homeland Security will come to order. Before we begin this morning, I would like to take a moment to reflect upon the horror that unfolded in Uvalde, Texas yesterday. Our heartfelt condolences are extended to the family and friends of the teachers and children that were appallingly killed while in their school classrooms. Mere words cannot convey our feelings of anger and sadness. Mass shootings are a growing plague in this country that we in Congress have a duty to help address. I hope we can come together to make that happen. I wanna acknowledge the brave and the heroic actions of first responders, including US Border Patrol agents who heard the call of an active shooter yesterday and quickly responded. Without their actions, the loss of life would no doubt have been much worse. I ask that we have a brief moment of silence to remember what was lost yesterday by the victims and their families and by the Uvalde community. Today's hearing on the Federal Emergency Management Agency's budget request for fiscal year 2023 is being conducted virtually. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. When you are recognized to speak and have not unmuted yourself, I will ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. To avoid inadvertent background noise, I or staff I designate may mute participant microphones when they are not recognized to speak. If there is a technology issue during a member's speaking time, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. We will be following the five minute rule with one minute remaining in your time. The clock will turn yellow. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and it will be time to recognize the next member. We will follow the speaking order set forth in the house rules, alternating by party beginning with the chair and ranking member, and then going to members present at the time the hearing is called to order in order of seniority. We will continue alternating by party until every member present has had a first round. Members can submit information in writing at any of our hearings or markups using the email address provided in advance to your staff. Now let us begin. Welcome Administrator Deanne Griswell to today's hearing, which is your first time testifying before the subcommittee. The members of this subcommittee and members of Congress overall greatly appreciate and support the work you, your colleagues at FEMA and emergency managers across the country do to help our communities and constituents before, during, and after disasters. For more than two years, emergency management professionals at all levels of government have worked tirelessly under unprecedented conditions to assist our nation during the pandemic while also responding to hurricanes, fires, tornadoes, and floods. Unfortunately, climate change appears to be contributing to the increased severity and frequency of major disasters, which will require expanded investments in FEMA's response capabilities and capacity. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, there were $21 billion natural disasters last year, including winter storms, wildfires, floods, tornadoes, cyclones, and severe wind events with a total economic cost of $145 billion. That's the third most costly year on record when adjusting for inflation. And the total cost for the last five years, $765 billion is more than one third of the total disaster cost for the last 42 years. This morning, we look forward to hearing your assessment of FEMA's resource requirements for the upcoming fiscal year and beyond. 
I will now turn to the distinguished gentleman from Tennessee, Ranking Member Fleischman, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing. And perhaps most importantly, I want to associate myself with your comments and sentiments. And thank you for that moment of silence. Uh, for me, it was also a moment of prayer for the uh, victims and families of yesterday's shooting. Um, the magnitude uh, and depth of this horror is, is shocking and um, people just many people just will never recover from this so again our hearts and prayers uh go out uh to the entire community and all all involved but again thank you um, administrator criswell i wanted to thank you uh for your testimony today as we discuss the fema fiscal year for 2023 and the budget request FEMA's mission is to help people before, during, and after disasters. But over the course of the last two years, FEMA has become, to use a baseball analogy, the nation's disaster utility player, clearly showcasing their ability to excel in efforts well outside the normal area of expertise. From personal protective equipment to vaccines, lost wages, and funeral assistance, FEMA has been called on to tackle every aspect of the nation's collective COVID response. In fact, FEMA coordinated over 10,000 interagencies and contract staff deployments to administer vaccines. Thus far, FEMA has obligated more than $96 billion from the Disaster Relief Fund in support of COVID efforts, an incredible sum. Administrator Criswell, please convey our sincere thanks for all the work that the men and women of FEMA have done behind the scenes that helped lead us to where we are today, hopefully in the waning days of this terrible pandemic that has claimed so many lives. Despite all of FEMA's good work with COVID, there are always a few bad actors, all too eager to fraudulently take advantage of a terrible situation. Limited guardrails and safeguards in some of those programs enabled people with malicious intent to exploit the massive sums of money Congress appropriated to address the crisis. Sadly, several investigations are underway that involve fraud schemes with the aim to steal money from taxpayers and those with legitimate needs only to criminally enrich themselves. And of course, all of the agency's covert efforts are on top of FEMA's typical work to help the nation prepare, mitigate, and respond to natural disasters like wildfires, tornadoes, floods, and hurricanes. Emergency management is, share, is a shared responsibility where disaster operations that require capabilities beyond that of state and local governments can be federally supported even if the local governments manage and execute the day-to-day -day recovery operations. One of the principal ways FEMA supports state and local preparedness is through grant-making authority. And this year's federal assistance request, which includes grants, totals three and a half billion dollars. Grants cover a wide range of preparedness and mitigation activities, including support to firefighters, hazard mitigation, and terrorism prevention activities. This year's request also includes funding for critical infrastructure, cybersecurity grants, and substantial increase for nonprofit security grants. As we use these grants to buy down risk, FEMA's risk calculation formulas should consider the significant sums of funding we have allocated to a relatively few localities and take into account new risks faced across the nation. I offer my sincere gratitude to the people of FEMA who've been on the job in some of the worst of times. Thank you, Administrator Criswell, and to everyone at FEMA for their amazing work and cooperation with our states. Madam Chairman, I thank you and I yield back. Administrator Criswell, we will submit the full text of your official statement for the hearing record. Please begin your oral summary, which I would ask you to keep to five minutes. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before I begin my testimony today, um, I would also just like to say that my heart breaks for the community of Uvalde, Texas. Um, I'm a mom and I'm a grandmother and I am horrified by the scenes that I saw yesterday. And this comes just days after the events in Buffalo and across the country. And I know that our entire FEMA family is heartbroken as well. Chairwoman Roybal Allard and Ranking Member Fleischman and other members of the subcommittee, I would like to thank you for the opportunity today to testify regarding FEMA's $29.5 billion request for fiscal year 23. 10 years ago, we managed an average of 108 disasters a year. Today, we are managing 311. This includes the ongoing response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Natural disasters are more frequent, more intense, and more destructive, and this pattern will continue for the foreseeable future. Disasters are no longer falling within certain months of the year. Instead, disaster seasons are year-long events. Our fiscal year 23 funding request ensures that our agency can meet these challenges and be prepared for the future as it helps the nation before, during, and after disasters. FEMA has aligned its budget request to support the goals outlined in our 2022-2026 strategic plan. These goals are one, to instill equity as the foundation of emergency management, two, lead the whole of community in climate resilience, and three, promote and stain a ready FEMA and a prepared nation. I would like to begin by addressing equity. It is important that we recognize that disasters affect individuals and communities differently. We must commit ourselves to eliminating barriers to access and commit to delivering equitable outcomes for all survivors. And truly, equity considerations have been woven into everything that we do at FEMA and throughout our $29.5 billion request. To take but one example, FEMA is requesting funding to add 23 regional interagency coordinators within its 10 FEMA regional offices, as well as headquarters. This staff is going to work with our governmental partners and assist them in addressing equity to underserved communities. This increased capability will allow FEMA to work with these stakeholders to ensure that they can maximize their preparedness, recovery, and mitigation efforts for communities in an equitable manner. And next, let's look at climate resilience. FEMA is not just a response and recovery agency. One of my highest priorities is to focus equally on mitigation. We must recognize that the climate crisis and integrate future conditions into our planning efforts now. Our request includes $3.4 billion to support strategies to address climate change through community partnerships. This includes further investments in the Building Resilient Infrastructure and in Communities, or BRIC, our Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, flood mapping, and federal flood risk management standards. Specifically, we are setting aside $1 billion of the Disaster Relief Fund to be used exclusively for the BRIC program. This set aside will help communities build capacity by funding hazard mitigation projects such as seismic retrofits, stormwater management plans, and construction of flood control and floodways. Our budget request also supports our efforts to promote and sustain a ready FEMA and a prepared nation. The increase in frequency, severity, and complexity of disasters has heightened the demands on FEMA's workforce and on our first responders in every state, in every territory, tribal nation, county, and city across the nation. To rise to this challenge, FEMA must expand its approach to agency readiness and to national preparedness. FEMA's request includes $19.7 billion for the Disaster Relief Fund to address current and future disasters. To reach this number, FEMA worked shoulder to shoulder with disaster impacted states and localities to understand their recovery needs from ongoing catastrophic disasters, in addition to evaluating the historical cost average for non-catastrophic disasters. 
The previously mentioned allocation for BRIC and a reserve to ensure FEMA maintains the ability to fund initial response operations for new significant events. And while natural disasters are at the forefront of our discussions, we cannot overlook other threats facing our nation, which FEMA is also charged with helping with. We are reminded of this earlier this year during a hostage standoff at the Congregation Beth Israel Synagogue in Colleyville, Texas. I visited the Congregation Beth Israel and spoke to the rabbi at the synagogue following this attack. He spoke to me about the importance of FEMA's nonprofit security grant program and how it helped save lives given the increasing threat to houses of worship and other nonprofit institutions. We are asking Congress to increase funding for this program to $360 million. In closing, the fiscal year 23 appropriations request is equal to the critical challenges that we face. And I look forward to your questions. Administrator uh, Criswell, in, in the last several years, we've heard growing concerns that the application process for individuals and household assistance has become overly complicated, perhaps as part of the effort to help prevent fraud. Fraud has been a real problem in the past and FEMA is right to try to prevent it. But if the process is leading some eligible applicants to be incorrectly screened out or to give up seeking benefits to which they are entitled because the process is too difficult or because of the mistaken belief they are not eligible, the agency needs to take a fresh look at whether it is striking the right balance. In the report accompanying the FY22 Funding Act, we acknowledge steps FEMA is taking to address this situation. We also asked the Inspector General to review this issue, including whether recommendations made by the OIG and other oversight entities may have influenced FEMA to adopt overly restrictive policies. Can you tell us what steps FEMA is taking to address this problem and do you think prior oversight efforts may have contributed to it? Uh, Chairwoman Royal Allard, thank you so much for that question. Um, our support to individuals, to me, is one of the most important things that we can provide as an agency. Uh, we are one of the few federal agencies that has that um, immediate direct impact on communities and on individuals. Um, our processes can be difficult to navigate, and some of the documentation that we had uh, been requesting in the past was overly restrictive. Uh, we took a hard look at our program specifically to the type of documentation that we accept um, in regards to individuals or families that own property that perhaps have been passed down through the generations and they may not have had the appropriate deed or paperwork um, that we were requesting. So we made some changes to our policies last year uh, ahead of hurricane season and we've seen some significant change in the amount of individuals that have been eligible for our program. And I'd like to just give you a couple of numbers um, so since we implemented these changes on the types of documentation we accept, um, we were able to help more than 42,000 homeowners as well as 53,000 renters last year receive assistance. These are individuals that just the year prior we would have probably denied for assistance. And we also changed the cal uh, how we calculate the property threshold for properties. Um, our formula and, and the things that we were doing was um, um, not allowing us to take into account the uh, lower value homes that people may have. And so we changed it from a fixed threshold to a price per square foot threshold. And this change resulted in an additional 2,700 survivors being able to be eligible for our direct housing program after Hurricane Ida. These are just the first steps. We know that we have more work to do and we're continuing to look into ways that we can improve our programs. And uh, right now, some of the things that we are restricted by is the fact that we can only support the rebuilding to safe and sanitary into a habitable state. Um, as we continue to look at the types of regulatory or legislative changes we can make, we hope that we can make significant difference in how we help survivors. Okay. Administrator, we are already experiencing another active fire season in the West due to drought linked to climate change, including the fire in New Mexico. And in addition to providing assistance through major disaster and emergency declarations by the president, FEMA also has the authority to provide fire management assistant grants. Does FEMA prepare for the Western wildfire season 
in the same way it does for the Atlantic hurricane, hurricane season. For example, if a state prepositions resources before a hurricane, FEMA often pays for those costs through a disaster declaration or a pre-landfall emergency declaration. However, I understand from my home state of California that if in-state resources are prepositioned for a wildfire, they are not eligible for reimbursement under current FMAG regulations. Is that the case? And if so, what is the basis for this disparity? Uh, Chairwoman, the wildfire situation that we are seeing is uh, continually, to, continually presenting us more unique challenges than we have faced in the past. Uh, we have gotten more aggressive in how we do pre-landfall declarations for hurricanes as we see them coming. Um, and we are looking closely at how we administer our fire management assistance grant program and the things that we can do to support the wildfire activities that are happening um, in these states that are experiencing this increase. Um, we recently just held our first ever FEMA wildfire summit with leadership from all 10 of our regions to have this very conversation of what you brought up and how we can better support our states and our local jurisdictions as they continue um, to have to respond to an increased number of wildfires. And I, I'll work with my team to make sure that you are informed along the way as we make changes to that level of support. Okay, so, so there's a consideration that there may be additional resources being provided to state, tribal, and local governments in anticipation of the wildfire season? Um, I would, no, I wouldn't say additional resources, ma'am. What I would say is we, we continue to provide our fire management assistance grants, but what we are seeing is that these wildfires are becoming more destructive and a, and a, a larger number of these fires are actually reaching the major disaster declaration level. And so we want to know better understand how we can now work within our programs and our statutory authorities to support states um, more proactively. Okay, okay. Uh, I just have one more question. I know my time is up, but does FEMA have any plans to embed staff in California operational areas during peak Santa Ana wind events as it does in coastal states in anticipation of hurricanes? Um, our states, uh, our regions, I would say, have what we call FEMA integration teams, as well as some of our regional staff that are embedded in every state across the country. Um, and as a state has a specific need or request, we can certainly accommodate that request. All right. And I look forward to whatever uh, discussions you have on how to be more, from my perspective, from California's perspective, more equitable in the way, uh, you know, California and, and Western states are treated versus, um, you know, what happens in terms of uh, hurricanes. So I look forward to your, your feedback on, on that. Uh, Mr. Fleischman. Thank you again, Madam Chairwoman, for this hearing and welcome again, uh, Administrator Chris Wolf. Um, Madam Administrator, since September the 11th, we've spent billions of dollars in grants to increase interoperability, add capability for the nation's firefighters, mitigate man-made and natural disasters, and made other worthwhile investments. When we look at the totality of our grant spending, how do we know if we've made the right investments and spent taxpayer dollars wisely to buy down the right risks that face our communities? Put in other words, how do you measure the success of FEMA grant programs? Thank you. Uh, Ranking Member Fleischman, first I would just like to say thank you for um, your gratitude towards our FEMA staff and the work that they've done. I know that it will go a long way um, in, uh, in uh, acknowledging all the hard work that they've done, not just for COVID-19, but throughout um, some of the responses that we've had. Um, as you stated, our grant programs are instrumental in improving the preparedness of our jurisdictions across the country. And I believe that we have created um, increased capacity around the nation as it comes to the things that are eligible underneath our grant programs. Some of the ways that we measure the effectiveness is through our annual uh, state preparedness report and our, our Thyra, which is the threat and hazard um, risk assessment, to see if we are increasing capacity 
capacity um, through the grant spending. Um, one of the things that we have done this year um, in the, the, the notice of funding opportunity that was just released is we have changed our risk formula, I think to something that you said in your opening statement, to better represent the types of threats that we are facing across the nation. Uh, these terrorism grants were created 20 years ago, post 9-11, but we've seen that our threats continue to evolve and change to include more domestic violent extremism. And so our new grant formula um, that we rolled out this year takes that into account so we can make sure we're both the threats our nation is facing. And we're gonna continue to work on evolving this grant formula as well as defining the metrics that we're gonna use to um, to measure the effectiveness of them as we continue to roll them out in the future. Thank you. A uh, little bit of a follow-up to that question, uh, Madam Administrator. Is there a better way to measure grant effectiveness and build that into future notices of grant funding opportunities? I think one of the ways that we can continue to look at grant effectiveness is lessons learned and things that we've heard from our stakeholders. A great example of that is Colleyville, um, where they directly stated how important the grant funding that they received from the nonprofit security grant was in improving their own capability to respond to that event. Those types of success stories are things that I think that we need to um, gather more deliberately so we can share with others across the country. Thank you. Can you please explain how FEMA allocates grant dollars in the Urban Area Security Initiative and state homeland security programs? Do they consider previous investments made that ostensibly buy down risk, and should that be a consideration? Uh, the Urban Area Security Initiative, uh, it is one of our suite of, or part of the suite of Homeland Security grants that we have, and it is such an incredibly important tool in how we help keep Americans safe across the country. Um, the formula that we use is the risk formula that I just previously mentioned that takes into account uh, threat, consequence, and vulnerability. Um, and so with that, the way that we allocate the funding is to those uh, urban area metropolitan statistical areas that encompass 85% of the nation's greatest risk. And so with that, it just takes into account those that have the greatest risk across the nation and then allocate it across those jurisdictions. Thank you very much, ma'am. I appreciate the answers to my questions. And Madam Chair, I will yield back. Ms. Underwood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Administrator Criswell, thank you for being with us today. I've been glad to see your emphasis as administrator on equity and user-friendly information as the foundation of FEMA services. Equity and clear information are two of my highest priorities as well, which is why I'm focused on ensuring nursing parents have the breastfeeding supports they need during a disaster. Currently, FEMA's guidance materials specifically cite infant formula as eligible for critical needs assistance, or CNA, but there's no information on how nursing families can receive financial assistance for a breast pump or any other necessary breastfeeding equipment. This means parents have to proactively ask and state and local emergency management officials have to determine eligibility all in the middle of a crisis. After hearing about the confusion these inconsistencies cause survivors, disasters, coordinators, and volunteers on the ground, I introduced the Demand Act to make breast pumps and other lactation supplies explicitly eligible for FEMA's financial assistance. In March, I sent you a letter urging FEMA to provide clear guidance to parents and emergency management partners on assistance for lactation equipment and breastfeeding support services by one, updating FEMA's website with user-friendly information, and two, explicitly including these supports in FEMA's individual assistance program and policy guide update in 2023. Last week, I received your team's response to my letter. The response lays out the available assistance at FEMA stating, quote, financial assistance provided through CNA could be used for breastfeeding support and equipment if that is how the applicant chooses to use those funds to meet their post-disaster needs. Now, I appreciate this response, but I'm concerned that this information is not more public. If breastfeeding equipment is already an eligible expense under CNA, FEMA needs to proactively communicate that to families and emergency management officials now. We can't wait until another hurricane season has passed. 
So my question to you is, can you commit to updating FEMA's website to make information about lactation equipment and breastfeeding support services available to the public? Uh, Representative Underwood, I truly appreciate your concern and your advocacy for survivors. And as a mother myself, I understand caring for newborns um, is critically important um, and that, that our website does not necessarily address the concerns that you have. Um, it is an eligible expense under critical needs assistance, and we are going to update that in our next update of the Individual Assistance Policy Guide in 23, so it will be in there. Um, but I will absolutely work with my external affairs team to make sure that, one, our website is more clear and to see if there's additional fact sheets that we can put out to make sure that um, our state and local jurisdictions have that awareness as well. Thank you. When can we expect that update to be available online? I'll have my team get back to you, um, but certainly as hurricane season is approaching on June 1st, uh, you can see that soonest. Thank you. I view public facing materials, including a website update as a critical way for FEMA to clarify its assistance for breastfeeding parents. As you know, during a disaster, parents are going through some of the hardest days of their lives, and they should be able to quickly find information on how they can feed their newborn babies. What else can FEMA do in the short term and long term to ensure assistance is available and accessible to breastfeeding parents? I think, again, as we uh... Um, representative, as we update our website and we get information out to state and local jurisdictions, that's going to be our first step. Um, but certainly the most important time to make sure information is getting out there is after a disaster has been declared and we're starting to communicate with the public. Um, I believe some of the things that we can do is make sure if they visit one of our disaster recovery centers that that information is available for them as they come in there. Um, but I can also commit to making sure that we uh, provide some training for our disaster survivor assistance teams that do go out into the public and talk to survivors one-on-one -on -one to find out what their needs are and make sure that they have that information and they can let them know one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. As you're the first woman to lead FEMA, I appreciate your focus on addressing inequities in our national emergency management and response. This work has always been needed, but it will only become more dire as climate-related natural disasters continue to increase. I look forward to partnering with you on these important issues to ensure families are not left behind in the aftermath of disasters. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Rutherford. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member. Uh, listen, if, uh, and I'm speaking to everyone, if, uh, if you haven't heard about this issue, uh, you need to make yourselves aware of it, uh, particularly if you're in hurricane prone areas like, like I am here in Florida. Uh, I'm hearing from our municipal power companies uh, back home with great concern about supply chains as we enter the hurricane season. Usually as a, as a storm approaches, uh, these companies, they, they begin to stockpile equipment that they know they're gonna to need to get the grid back up, the electrical grid back up uh, after these storms have struck. I can tell you already, they are struggling to find supplies due to the supply chain issues. Transformers particularly, this is just one example. And, and obviously transformers are a vital piece of our recovery. Uh, it used to take three months to get a delivery of a transformer. It's now taking up to 75 months. Now that puts our entire grid at extreme risk for long, long periods of time. And so Ms. Griswell, I'd, I'd like to ask in the lead up to the hurricane season, uh, June 1st, can, can you discuss what FEMA is doing to work with states, localities, and power companies, not just the munis, I, I think even the, the private uh, companies are having difficulty. Uh, can, can you tell us what you can do to help with these stockpiles and bolster supplies that are, that are gonna be necessary and vital for recovery? A representative Rutherford, the private sector is such a critical partner in our ability to recover from these disasters, and in particular, our power companies. 
Um, I know that the impacts that we're seeing from the supply chain concerns um, are causing all of us to make sure that we're taking the extra steps now to have conversations about what the potential risks might be and what the limitations might be in our ability to help communities recover. I think one of the best ways that we are approaching this understanding or trying to gain this understanding is through our regional administrators who work very closely with all of our state partners as well as um, the private entities that support their recovery efforts to better understand what their capabilities are and what their gaps might be. Um, we on the FEMA side have made sure that we have um, our stockpiles in place um, at our distribution centers across the nation. Um, we do have generators in place that can support critical infrastructure as needed or as requested by the states. I um, mean, we're going to continue to work really closely with our state partners through our regional offices to understand what their shortfalls might be and what we can do to help um, mitigate that in the interim while they're trying to get back Ms. online. Griswell, uh, Ms. Griswell, I'm not worried about generators. I'm worried about transformers. I understand. Uh, and so my, my real question is, or I want to put you on notice that we're going to be asking after the next hurricane, uh, are these transformers available? What has the federal government done to help these localities get prepared and have the necessary transformers because that's the problem, not, not generators. Transformers are the problem of getting our grid back up. Uh, can, can you tell me what we're doing about transformers specifically? And do we have them stockpiled? And so again, Congressman, uh, transformers are an issue. FEMA does not stockpile transformers. What we do is support the uh, temporary restoration of power while the private sector restores the power. Uh, we will continue to connect through our regional administrators and our state emergency management partners on what their potential um, identified needs and shortfalls might be. But our role will be to come in and temporarily provide support while the private sector uh, restores the power. Okay. Well, well, thank you very much. And, and listen, anything that you can do to help us, my understanding is a lot of these are manufactured over in China, and that's the biggest problem uh, in getting them. Uh, this is going to be, uh, I'm, I'm just telling everyone, this is going to be a major problem this hurricane season. And I just want everybody to be on notice that uh, you know, these transformers are very, very, very difficult to come by. Uh, so my, my next question I'd like to ask on, on, the, uh, on the border crisis. I know FEMA administers a grant program that nonprofits use to coordinate the travel of these immigrants from uh, the border to the interior of the country after they've been released. My question is, DHS, ICE, FEMA, the grantees themselves and the localities that these people are being moved to, are they notifying anyone about who's coming into their into their uh, jurisdiction? I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I see my time just ran out. I'm sorry. I'll I'll say that for the next round. I, I yield back. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Rutherford. Um, Mr. Rupesberger. Okay. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Administrator uh, Criswell. Thank you for being here. Um, you have a very difficult job. We know that. And uh, we're part of our job is to try to support you and get you the resources that you need. Uh, your agency has the critical mission to respond to and to mitigate every man-made and natural conceivable, uh, nearly impossible, and that's nearly an impossible a task. But you're there and we're gonna, you're gonna, gonna work with you. Uh, in that vein, I'd like to take the opportunity to highlight a program that can be used to combat both. FEMA's Port Security Grant Program largely flies under the radar, but has made a profound impact in my district, especially in the Port of Baltimore, which I represent. Last year, the port received a 1.6 million grant to bring their cybersecurity infrastructure into the 21st century by improving access control uh, procedures and initiatives, as well as upgrading software and licensed products. America's ports generate 4.6 trillion in revenue and employ 23 million 
people throughout the country. The Port of Baltimore alone generates 310 million in state, county, and municipal revenue each year. The bottom line is that the economic impact of seaports cannot be understated. Now, according to the Brookings Center, it would take only a small attack on our ports to grind U.S. commerce to a halt within days. Uh, the need for port security cannot be understated. And for this reason, I was pleased to see the administration's request of $100 million for the program, but believe we can do more. Uh, now, Administrator, in your opinion, what are our biggest cybersecurity threats to our, our uh, official ports of entry? What are the potential consequences? And is $100 million enough to meet the needs at seaports? Uh, Congressman Rupersberger, our ports of entry um, are such a critical part of our infrastructure. And I think if there's anything that we have um, really learned over the first three months of this year, or the first half of this year, is that the cybersecurity threats to all of our critical infrastructure um, gave us an increased awareness of the vulnerability that they face. And so we are committed to continuing to work through the Port Security Grant Program to fund the critical needs to help the ports um, build resilience against all types of attacks. Um, and I do believe that the, um, the $100 million that we currently have for the program, based on how it has been utilized and the requests that have been made in the past, has been sufficient. Um, I would also like to note, though, that we did release um, this year, too, um, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, a $1 billion cybersecurity grant program that we will be administering on behalf of CISA. Uh, it's another opportunity for us to increase the cyber resilience for all of our critical infrastructure to include ports. Um, if we do find that this program becomes overextended, um, I'd be happy to continue to work with Congress on ways we, that we can increase the funding and how we can continue to improve the, the readiness and the resilience of this critical piece of our infrastructure. Well, thank you for your comments, and I yield back. Ms. Hansen. Right. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate you uh, holding this hearing today. And I know, obviously, we share the commitment of ensuring that our communities have strong disaster support. And Administrator Criswell, as we have previously discussed, um, welcome back. Um, I know that uh, we have talked in the past about um, the major storm that came through my district in August of 2020. Um, Eastern Iowa, of course, subjected to um, a terrible derecho storm. Uh, we call it the land hurricane here in Iowa, but it uh, wreaked um, havoc upon uh, many of the communities that I represent. Um, the costliest thunderstorm in U.S. history, homes, property, crops, um, lives were lost as well. So um, we are still putting pieces back together in many of our communities, but I just wanted to say thank you to you today um, for your continued partnership because um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, FEMA announced an additional 15 million to Lynn County for derecho response in um, I know those dollars meet a very critical need in our community. So just wanted to start off by saying thank you there. Um, and uh, my first question today, um, as I'm out meeting with folks in the district, um, preparing for the next disaster is always top of mind. Um, we're no stranger to those um, strong storms coming through Iowa. And while many of our communities have resources to invest in prep, um, many of them do not, um, especially when it comes to our smaller rural communities. And um, FEMA's pre-disaster mitigation funds um, can make a world of difference in smaller communities. Um, we know that investment in disaster mitigation brings strong returns on investment, right? A, a dollar uh, spent can uh, really return on that investment, saving both taxpayer dollars and lives. Um, and one of the top programs at FEMA, the BRIC program, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, um, makes those targeted investments to mitigate disasters. But where my concern is here, um, Administrator, is that um, in the previous cycle of those BRIC funds that went out, FEMA allocated um, over 50% of those awards to just three states, California, Washington, and New Jersey. So um, in your testimony, you mentioned, obviously, we're focused uh, on, through FEMA, at uh, equitable response to disaster. So uh, I guess I, I'm concerned, and I, I would ask, how uh, are you at FEMA working toward a more equitable distribution of uh, the BRIC funds, for example, to ensure that rural communities are not left out of this process? Congressman Hinson, I think that uh, you are spot on when we talk about the investment made with pre-disaster mitigation funding and the value, the return on investment that we're going to get. 
uh, it, it's incredible time for us to make sure that we're taking that into account as we continue to see um, increased devastation from some of these storms. And we have to reduce the impact so we can um, continue to be able to respond to these events. Our BRIC program is one of our um, key programs to do this. And the first year of its um, delivery, the, the jurisdictions that were announced, we did notice that there was uh, gaps, deserts across the middle of the United States in who was eligible or who was granted um, an award from the competitive side of the program. Um, I would state that all states do get a baseline funding, but the competitive side um, was really geared towards more of our, our coastal states or larger cities. Uh, we did make some changes in our program um, for the formula this year um, to give additional points to uh, underserved communities and minority communities so we could better reflect those communities that have greater need so we could help build their capacity. And um, we've just that the grant period for that has closed um, and we have, um, I think we're getting ready to make the uh, pre-award announcements later this summer. Um, but this is a new program and we're gonna continue to take feedback like what I just got from you so we can improve this program to make sure that we are making sound investments in those areas that need the capacity building the most. Well, and I certainly appreciate that. And I, I know we wanna make sure we're targeting to communities that um, maybe have been overlooked in the past, um, underserved communities, for example. But um, when you look at um, rural communities, I think that's definitely something that I would just flag as you're looking at the map of the country and where we're targeting those resources. And you spoke about uh, eliminating uh, barriers to, um, to these communities. Um, have you identified any barriers specifically for the smaller rural communities through that competitive process? And then I would just ask, um, you know, how can we tackle those together? I mean, is it just the feedback? Um, I, I'd ask you commit to work with our office on making sure we can refine the process so people can access those resources. Yeah, I, I would say that I think some of the biggest barriers are just the complication of our process, right? And so we want to continue to work, especially with our rural communities, on how to help them navigate that process. Uh, one of the ways that we are doing that is through directed technical assistance with our BRIC program to help especially rural communities, underserved communities, develop projects um, that can be more competitive. And we want to provide that direct assistance to take the burden off of them. And so that's one of our key focus areas. Um, and if there's communities um, in Iowa that have not um, applied for that, you know, I would love to be able to have my team work with your staff so we can do some outreach for them. I would also like to add that uh, we did also, though, um, um, uh, authorized, the president authorized $3.46 billion last year as part of the COVID-19 hazard mitigation grant program. It's only the second time that we've given hazard mitigation funding for a non-natural disaster, and the first time was after 9-11. And so that increased the amount of funding that every state does have to uh, do disaster mitigation projects, and it can be for any project that the state deems a priority. Well, I certainly appreciate that, and I see my time has expired, so Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Administrator. Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, thanks to the ranking member, and thank you so much for being here. We, uh, we appreciate the great work that you're doing and look forward to uh, so many efforts together. Uh, a question about flood mapping, um, and you know how important that is. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I guess the question is, is, is this an issue of methodology or just needing to be updated? Uh, there are issues with how accurate flood maps are across the country. In Chicago, uh, FEMA, FEMA had previously produced flood maps for Chicago that say that only three out of every 1,000 properties should flood every 100 years. Obviously, this, this isn't the case. Uh, so what's FEMA doing to try to get more accurate flood mapping? And is it a, a combination of those things, a methodology, updating them, or just errors in the past? Uh, Congressman Quigley, um, flooding is our nation's most costly disaster and our flood mapping is one of the tools that we have to help communities better understand um, their risk. Um, we do provide assistance to communities across the nation to help them update their flood mapping. Um, and I'd also like to point out that our flood mapping is really based on coastal flooding and riverine flooding. Um, it does not take into account rainfall 
and how quickly rainfall might happen. And so we have to keep that in mind. Um, one of the ways that we want to be able to help increase the amount of flood mapping capacity that we're doing is in our fiscal year 23 budget request, we have asked for $4.3 million and 30 additional employees that will enable us to reach more of our communities and help them update their flood mapping. Um, this is a critical need and a critical um, tool for our, our state and local jurisdictions to use, and we want to make sure that we have the appropriate funding and staffing to support them. Yeah, we want to make sure that we work with you on that because with climate change and the new world, the, there are so many different dynamics and obviously FEMA was focused, as you said, on coastal areas and other traditional, but we've seen a, a dramatic increase in urban flooding issues and the costs that are involved and the risks that are involved. So I'm hoping <laughs> that we can work with you on an ongoing basis uh, to work with our local jurisdictions to make sure we get this right, because as you said, this flood mapping really matters and it's very important to inform our constituents what they're facing as well. Yeah, and again, it's our flood mapping is for coastal as well as river flooding. Um, and we wanna to continue to provide the assistance. Um, we provide assistance to the level that we can right now, but this increased funding in our fiscal year 23 request is gonna give us that ability to reach more communities and help them better understand what their risks are. I appreciate that. We look forward to working with you in your office. Thanks for your service. And I yield back. Mr. Palazzo. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Ranking Member. Uh, Administrator Criswell, thank you for being with us today. And thank you for the many trips you've made to our state um, after natural disasters. Um, I think Mississippi's always had a, a great relationship with our FEMA administrators, not by choice, but because of um, unexpected uh, natural um, incidents that we have. Um, so, you know, Hurricane Katrina, um, you know, is still fresh in many, many people's minds here in South Mississippi. Uh, you know, but when we tackled uh, our response effort, we just didn't want to build back. We wanted to build forward. We wanted to be more resilient. We wanted to mitigate against um, future storms. Uh, so real quick, in, in your opinion and in, in practice of FEMA, is it to build back more resilient and stronger or to build back to your same standard as before the storm? Congressman Palazzo, I think that the, the crisis that we are facing right now um, in the face of climate change is continuing to grow every day. And one of the things that I have continued to talk to my team about, as well as emergency managers across the country, is that we can't do our planning based on historical risk, that we have to start to take into account what the potential future risk is going to be. Uh, the disasters that we're seeing today are different than 10 years ago, and they're going to be different 10 years from now. And so as we are working with communities to rebuild after disaster, we do encourage them to look at what the future conditions might be and how do we rebuild more resilient. That's why with every project, they do have an opportunity to increase the amount of the project threshold to incorporate hazard mitigation into that so they can build back more resilient. Yeah. I, I actually have a project that um, on the Mississippi Gulf Coast that we're working with uh, Region 4. I want to say uh, Greater uh, Gracia Check. Uh, and uh, she's been a delight to work with, by the way, the whole the whole group in Region 4 has been very responsive. Um, but we just got this one last project uh, in, on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. If we could get some um, I guess, uh, clarity on what they need to do next to uh, meet all the approvals necessary to build back uh, better, that would be great. And um, I do have I know you get a lot of questions about flood insurance. One of our biggest concerns, not just on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, but pretty much around the nation, and this is a bipartisan one party, and it's not really geographically limited to the coastal areas, but all across the nation, is the, the affordability and availability of flood insurance. I know uh, there's been a lot of concerns raised with risk rating 2.0, um, and I would love to um, meet with you in person or your staff to uh, get a greater understanding of risk rating 2.0, uh, find out how we can get some more transparency in the premium increases. Uh, and just also to say, you know, there's been a, a bipartisan effort to delay 
implementation. Um, you know, I do not think it's congressional intent to um, make a flood insurance uh, unavailable and unaffordable because that will lead to a loss of homes and loss of value in their homes as well. And again, this is this is nationwide. This is not South Mississippi. This is this is everywhere. Uh, there's a possibility of, of flooding. Uh, so um, I would love to be able to uh, meet in my office when we come back in session or set up another uh, phone call so we could discuss risk rate. Congressman Palazzo, I would be happy to come to your office and talk to you more about risk rating 2.0. Um, and I would just say, you know, we do understand uh, the affordability concerns and we fully support the affordability framework that is currently being considered um, with Congress um, in a legislative proposal to, to help make sure that families that need flood insurance can get it. Great, great. Because, you know, as you know, it, this, this also affects those um, uh, like they're in low income neighborhoods, uh, especially in my district. Um, so listen, and, and better than meeting in the office in DC, if you can make it to the Mississippi Gulf Coast, uh, we got. Uh, Congressman Palazzo, you cut out towards the end there, um, but uh, I think what I heard you say is come to the Gulf Coast, which I would be happy to come to the Gulf Coast as well. And the world's greatest seafood. All right. Thank you, um, Administrator. Feel back. Mr. Aguilar. Sorry about that, Administrator. Uh, Mr. Plaza never misses an opportunity to invite people down to the Gulf Coast, uh, but uh, uh, he uh, he he means uh, he means well, and I'm sure he would host you uh, with uh, with world class food as well. I wanted to follow up. Um, on the chairwoman's uh, comment and, and building off of what Mr. Palazzo said, honestly, about equity. Um, you know, the, ch the chairwoman talked a little bit about um, wildfire danger and equitability, uh, but Mr. Palazzo talked about the equitability of investments um, and that risk reduction uh, that we look at. Can you elaborate on the agency's plans to use funding to invest in community partnerships and ensure that it's done in an equitable um, way uh, getting toward risk reduction? I think one of the first things uh, that I would say, Congressman Aguilar, is that um, our, our mitigation funding um, is eligible funding for wildfire mitigation projects. Um, but what we see is very few communities actually put in applications for wildfire mitigation projects. And so we're doing a lot of outreach through our regional administrators, part of the summit that we had recently with all of our leadership from across the 10 regions to make sure we're getting that word out there as we're continuing to see the uh -huh the threat from wildfires across the nation. And so uh, it's a goal of mine to make sure that those communities that have increased threats, regardless of what they are, understand the types of resources that are available to them. I appreciate that. Um, and, and when we were talking about wildfires, I couldn't help but think about uh, the fact that uh, climate change is, is, is shown um, the number of natural disasters is going to continue to, to rise. And in California, clearly wildfire season isn't confined to a season anymore of a few months. It's year round. And so I was pleased to see that the president's budget requests emphasized how focusing on climate science and investing in resilient infrastructure will reduce risk from wildfires, floods, storms, and other extreme weather events. How can Congress support FEMA's goal to incorporate climate science to mitigate extreme weather events and support disadvantaged communities? You know, I think um, as it relates to wildfires, I think one of the, um, the great things that came out of the bipartisan infrastructure law was the establishment of the wildfire, wildland fire mitigation and management commission. Um, it's an opportunity for us to bring together uh, our state foresters, our state emergency managers, our private sector, our utility companies, um, and talk about what are the things that we can do as an entire enterprise to help reduce the risks that we're seeing from wildfire. I think the report that's going to come out of this commission is going to inform many of the activities that we take um, that could be transcended across the types of disasters that we're facing. I appreciate that. Can you, can you talk with us about how the budget request um, you know, deals with various natural disasters that, that may happen? Uh, across the country uh, over the next year, 
Uh, we're obviously no strangers to supplemental requests when um, big events happen, but but how, from an ongoing perspective, do we account for this, you know, financially, um, you know, through the next fiscal year? Yeah, I can, you know, I'll talk specifically about our disaster relief fund um, and some of the funding that we have in there. And I think right now where we're at, absent any multiple new catastrophic events or any, un, you know, unexpected significant COVID-19 costs, uh, the funding that we have requested in our disaster relief fund request, I think is going to be sufficient to support our response and recovery needs. Um, in our fiscal year 23 request, we're asking for um, $19.74 billion uh, to cover our DRF, our Disaster Relief Fund Major Disaster Declarations, which is going to give us sufficient funding to support the anticipated costs from COVID-19, as well as our ongoing recovery efforts for current disasters and any new catastrophic events that we might see. Didn't the bipartisan infrastructure bill also have some DRF funds associated with it? Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law did give us um, an additional $1 billion towards our building resilient infrastructure and communities program, as well as some of our um, other um, hazard mitigation programs um, on that building resilient infrastructure and communities. That would be in addition to uh, the funding that we take from the disaster relief fund um, as part of um, statute to support that program. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Administrator. Yield back, Madam Chair. That completes uh, the first round. And so now we are going to start uh, the second round. Administrator, uh, in the FY22 funding bill, we provided 40 million for next generation warning systems grants to help public broadcasters better provide critical information to communities across the country before and during disasters and emergencies through the integrated public alert and warning systems or IPAWS. Please tell us what role the public broadcasting system plays in IPAWS and how the next generation warning system grants enhance uh, IPAWS. Um, Chairwoman Roybal Allard, the, the public warning system and our public broadcasting stations are such a critical partner in our ability to make sure that we are giving ample warning to communities uh, when a potential threat arises. Uh, when you see an emergency alert across, come across your phone for a thunderstorm warning or a tornado warning, this is part of that system. And we want to make sure that our public broadcasting stations have the most up-to-date infrastructure to support that. And so the next gen warning system um, funding and the grant that you talked about is really going to help enhance the ability of our public warning, our public broadcasting stations across the country. And um, we're just beginning to implement this program, um, but I look forward to seeing how it's going to continue to increase the capacity that these stations have. Um, early last year, uh, President Biden raised the federal cost share for COVID disaster assistance to 100% and expanded the scope of assistance. FEMA recently announced, however, that the cost share will revert to 90% in July, citing a provision in the FY22 funding bill requiring the federal cost share for 2020 and 2021 disasters to be less than 90%. What is the rationale for reducing the cost share of COVID assistance? And will this change impact reimbursements for work already performed by state, tribal, and local governments. Yeah, as we are um, moving through our support for the COVID-19 pandemic, we have continued to support our state and local jurisdictions with the costs that they have incurred um, in response to this crisis. Uh, they have uh, been given 100% reimbursement and President Biden did backdate that back to the beginning of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which made sure that we were covering co uh, costs from the start of the pandemic, um, not just at the beginning of this administration, which was incredibly helpful to all of our state and local jurisdictions. As we are now moving more into a sustainment phase and how we are going to support jurisdictions, we did 
determined that it was time to move into our normal operating way of supporting disasters, and that is to do a 90% federal cost share with a 10% cost share for state and local jurisdictions. That does begin on July 1st, and that's something that we socialized with all of our state and local emergency managers earlier this year so they could be prepared for that. Um, this is only going to be for new costs incurred after that time frame. So any costs incurred prior to July 1st of this year will still be covered at 100%. Okay, and what will be the, the impact on, on current requests for reimbursement that have not yet been approved that, but, you know, uh, that are still in that pipeline? And um, are they then going to be in the 90% reimbursement or because they applied prior to the, you know, the change, uh, will they be uh, uh, grandfathered in? It's my understanding, ma'am, that it's any costs incurred prior to July 1st will be covered at 100%. Um, but we'll make sure that we put together a fact sheet so it's clear to everybody on what's going to be covered and what's not covered and when that transition is going to take place. I believe we did put one out already, um, and we can forward that to your office. But if it's not clear, we'll make sure that that's clear. And was, did FEMA uh, have any uh, consultations with our state and local or tribal uh, territorial and government uh, local governments prior to making this decision or was this made completely independent of them uh, no this was definitely made in consultation with our state and local emergency managers in fact myself meeting with uh, the national emergency management association which is all of our state directors having conversations with them about uh, what the next phase was going to be i um, mean so there was certainly consultation across the board okay uh, early last year president biden um raise the uh, cost share for COVID disaster assistance to um, 100 percent. Let me hold on one second. I didn't flip. Um, my, you know, I can see that my, my time is up. So I'm, I'm going to uh, call uh, Mr. Fleischman, but I do want to ask uh, a question about nonprofit security grant programs uh, in the next round. Mr. Fleischman. Thank you, Madam Chair. This has been an outstanding hearing. Uh, Madam Administrator as well, I appreciate all the comprehensive responses. Um, in my opening statement, I mentioned the incredible sum that has been obligated out of the disaster fund for various covert efforts, or at least at, uh, at last count, more than $96 billion. Unfortunately, with any large expenditure of funding, uh, criminals try to take advantage of the spending to enrich themselves. Can you speak to the guardrails, please, that FEMA has put in place to minimize fraud? Uh, some of the funding that, that we have uh, executed in response to COVID-19 um, were programs that were brand new to us. Um, and as we developed the uh, delivery models for these programs, uh, we worked closely um, with, um, with our partners to make sure that we were putting together or putting in place um, mechanisms to ensure for the to minimize fraud, waste, and abuse. Unfortunately, we are always gonna see, and you'll never get rid of it at 100%. We are gonna to continue to see different types of fraud, waste, and abuse. And as the programs continued to unfold, um, we would put in additional mechanisms to make sure that we were um, being um, proper stewards of the taxpayer dollar. A follow-up okay. question to that. Outside of COVID spending, does FEMA have the right process in place to verify eligibility for benefits for survivors of disasters. How do you balance the need to meet, how do you balance the need to meet basic needs quickly without opening disaster relief programs up to undue risk? And I do believe that we have the proper tools and mechanisms in place to validate those needs. Um, I believe that some of the processes that we had have been actually too restrictive. And that's why we have opened up some of the um, types of documentation we accept for certain programs so we can make sure that those who have the greatest need are also getting the greatest level of assistance. Uh, one of the other things that we have also done, though, is if we can't verify through this through our initial programs, um, we have instituted a 100% outreach to those that before we deny them, we can have a conversation with them and validate the information that they're giving us to ensure that they are eligible applicants for our programs. 
Very well. And finally, given the substantial spending related to the COVID-19 pandemic, does the disaster relief fund have enough of a cushion should the ma should a major disaster strike before we finish the work on the fiscal 2023 spending bill? I, I do believe that the health of our disaster relief fund right now is in good shape pending any um, unanticipated COVID-19 costs that we haven't planned for um, or multiple catastrophic events. Um, I do believe that our, our, our disaster relief fund is in good shape to get us through the end of this year. Madam Administrator, I know other people want to ask in the second round, so I'll just say thank you. And Madam Chair, I will yield back. Ms. Hinson. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Administrator. Um, wanted to follow up uh, as well a little bit on um, the derecho and some disaster assistance, worst case scenarios that actually played out um, after that happened um, in 2020. Uh, the GAO released a report um, called Additional Actions Needed to Strengthen FEMA's Individuals and Households Program. So that one lays out ways in which FEMA could really improve its individual disaster assistance program. So um, the priority recommendation asked FEMA to identify and implement strategies to provide applicants with um, information about their eligibility. And last year I wrote to FEMA about these reforms and the importance of supporting Iowans who are seeking that help from FEMA. So I would just ask today, uh, what progress would you say has been made in improving uh, not only the clarity, but the availability of assistance to individuals and households uh, following a disaster? Uh, yes, ma'am. The, uh, the report from the GAO, they did identify 14 actions to help strengthen our um, individual and households program. Um, and we are currently working to um, see how we can best implement those. Uh, some of the changes that we have already made um, go towards implementing some of the recommendations that were made by the GAO. Um, and I do also understand that um, that uh, as we implement our, our, our recommendations um, that we are also looking at how we can reduce the fraudulent um, disaster applications at the same time. Right. Um, I would be happy to have my staff get back with you on providing a more in-depth um, analysis of where we are in implementing these um, provisions um, and any um, additional actions that we think that we might need assistance with. Perfect. I, I appreciate that. And I completely understand what you're saying about making sure that we're we're trying to make sure that fraud is not rampant and we're getting those um, disaster assistance resources to the people who really need them. So um, I, I understand making sure that we are um, doing everything we can to prevent that and be um, judicious. Um, so my next question, how are you um, coordinating with all the communities? Um, and I, I think maybe this would be something that um, if you're going to follow up with us too, that you could look at, but um, how are you coordinating on recommendations to ensure that um, the changes are actually being made? I mean, are you on the ground or how, how is that process kind of playing out so that we can make sure we're actually listening to them on the inputs um, from, from the feedback for what's happened? Yeah, I think it's incredibly important to hear from the people that are experiencing some of the frustrations with the, how we deliver our programs. And one of the things that I have done is go on listening tours to jurisdictions that have been recovering from disasters last year. I, I visited many states um, that um, are still in the recovery process from disasters several years ago and bringing that information back to help drive the way that we continue to improve the delivery of both our individual assistance and our public assistance programs. Um, those listening sessions led to direct changes in the individual assistance program, and we are also making changes to our public assistance program before this hurricane season based on those conversations. Uh, we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to listen to our customers um, and hear what their um, struggles are and, and where their burdens are so we can put in place the things that we need to to reduce their barriers. Okay. Um, and my last question, um, you know, obviously we've heard a lot today about uh, the all of the far reaching areas that you are doing work at FEMA, COVID-19 pandemic preparedness, um, natural disasters, the, the southern border refugee efforts. So obviously you're stretched pretty thin in, in terms of where you're going with your mission. And um, I talked with the DHS inspector general um, when I met with him recently. And so um, just I would ask about, you know, focus, right? Um, FEMA's um, you know, goal, obviously you have a lot of hats to wear, but I wanna make sure that you still have the utmost ability to focus on a disaster preparedness and response. So do you feel that um, your mission has been spread too broad? Do you need more narrow focus? Uh, what's your take there? 
Yeah, I would not say that we need more narrow focus. I think that the value that emergency managers across this nation bring to the table is our ability to collaborate and coordinate and bring all of the appropriate parties together to solve some of the tough challenges that we're facing today. Um, in some of the other instances that you talked about, our support to the southern border as well as um, uh, Operations Allies Welcome, uh, we just served in our coordinating role, bringing that skill set to the table with really a small amount of personnel to support those operations, um, but tapping into the skill set of collaborating and coordinating and building that structure so uh, the agency that we were supporting could be successful. Um, I feel strongly that our workforce is some of the best at that, um, and they are still very focused on supporting natural disasters, and I believe that we're in a good place going into this hurricane season. All right. Thank you, Administrator. I yield back now, Madam Chair. Mr. Rutherford. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and and I really, um, Ms. Griswold would would follow up on um, my good friend's uh, comments from Iowa, Ms. Henson. Uh, I, I have to tell you, one of the, one of the things that I worry most about is FEMA actually becoming a victim of their own success. I mean, I, honestly, I can tell you, uh, as as a law enforcement officer and having worked very closely with FEMA in Northeast Florida for many, many years. Uh, I, I can tell you they have one of the best responses that I think any federal agency uh, that, that I've worked with. And so my, my hat is off to FEMA. But it, you know, it, it's almost like what you regularly see is those who do, more gets pushed their way. And, and I just want to make sure, as Ms. Simpson was mentioning, you know, I want to, I want to make sure that that FEMA isn't overloaded, because I, I do see, and you you yourself made the made the comment in your in your opening remarks that while your core mission, and I'm going to quote, while your core mission has not changed, our operating environment has, and and I think that's what uh, the, the gentle lady from Iowa was really talking about. Uh, your operating environment really has changed, and. And I see areas where it looks like there's a, a mission creep, if you will, not, not in a bad way. I'm just saying you get the job done. Uh, but when I look at BRIC, and BRIC is talking about uh, floodgates, floodways, uh, stormwater, those are historically Army Corps issues. How is that shifting over to become uh, a, uh, a FEMA? Uh, issue. And then on, on the other side with uh, DOJ and the non-public uh, security grants, when, when I look at terrorism, cybersecurity, those things becoming part of FEMA's responsibilities, I, I don't want you to wear too many hats. I mean, I know you guys are great, but you can't do it all. And so can you talk a little bit about how you uh, how, how are you going to make sure that you're not getting into this mission creep? Uh, Congressman Rutherford, it's a really great question. Uh, I, I would say when we talk about BRIC specifically, um, FEMA has always been, and part one of the foundational elements of emergency management is mitigation and mitigating against natural disasters. And that's what our BRIC program is, and it replaced our pre-disaster mitigation program. And it provides an increased level of funding to our jurisdictions. Um, but it'll never match, actually, what the Army Corps of Engineers programs do. They do much larger projects. And so there's this shared responsibility across the federal family to address all of the different components. And when we work together, we create more resilient communities. And so that partnership with us and the Army Corps of Engineers through the different programs that we have collectively increase the resiliency across the agencies or across our communities. Um, well, I, as, I, I would just ask that, you know, we're going to be paying attention to that because I really don't want more being dumped on you, so to speak. Uh, but let, let me skip over to another issue that uh, Mr. Aguilar and Mr. Palazzo mentioned earlier, and that's the risk rating 2.0. Uh, particularly for those folks who are going to be grandfathered in, uh, even though the rates may go up, 
I, it really is important that they know what's coming. But I think even more importantly is this, this issue of some of these uh, discounts that can be made available to individuals for lifting their home, for uh, having flood openings and, and other discount capabilities. How are we going to communicate that to people so that they know uh, what they can do to, to actually help lower their rates? Yeah, I think that that is really the basis of the risk rating 2.0 program, right, is it does take into account now the individual risks that homes have. I think the best way for a homeowner to learn what the steps are that they can take to mitigate that, I would say two ways. One is really to work closely with their insurance agent. Their insurance agent can tell them the types of things that are going to reduce what their, their rates potentially could be, um, but they can also look um, at FEMA.gov on our mitigation page. And there's a number of resources there as well that talk about the types of risks different uh, homes have and the types of actions that they can take. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Griswold. I see my time's expired. I yield back, Madam Chair. I have uh, one final uh, question, uh, Administrator, and this has to do with nonprofit security, uh, the nonprofit security grant program. During my time as chair on this subcommittee, we've increased funding for the nonprofit security grant program more than threefold, from 60 million in FY 2019 to 220 million in FY 2022. The FY 2023 budget proposes funding this program at $360 million. Does FEMA believe that the demand for these grants is sufficient to warrant a $360 million funding level next year? And does FEMA actually have the resources to administer the program at that funding level? Uh, Chairman Royal Albert Allard, this is uh, an incredibly important program to help increase resiliency across the nation. I think as we continue to see our threat landscape change, it's more important to, uh, than ever to make sure that our grant programs can support some of these targeted threats that we're having. Um, I do believe that the funding is needed and the program is still oversubscribed um, to those applicants that are coming in and asking for funding from the program. So this increase is going to make such a big difference in our ability to uh, increase resilience and the protection of some of these nonprofits across the nation. And as I talked about with the synagogue that I met with earlier this year in Colleyville, Texas, specifically identifying that that program made the biggest difference in their ability to, um, to recover or respond to that event. Um, we do have the staff that is available to support this, and uh, we will continue to work with our regions to help support the implementation. Um, and if we need to bring on some more staff to support that, we can do that. But right now, I think that we are, we are good in supporting the implementation of this program. Okay, and just finally, FEMA recently announced changes in the scoring for applications in this program for FY 2022. Can you explain what these uh, changes are and, and the rationale for them? Um, I don't have the specific changes uh, here right in front of me. I know that across all of our programs, we've made some changes um, in how we calculate risk to make sure that we're better um, understanding the domestic risk that is out there, as well as um, increasing points for underserved communities. I think one of the changes that I know that we made is we want to encourage more nonprofits to apply for these grants. And so we, we gave additional points to first-time applicants for this program so we can encourage more nonprofit organizations to apply. Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, then we will conclude today's hearing. Uh, Administrator Criswell, thank you very much for your time. And thank you for everything that you and uh, your, your personnel do uh, on behalf of our country during some very, very trying times. The Subcommittee on Homeland Security stands adjourned. <laughs>